Okay, let me get your attention up here. Let's take a look. So we're gonna we're shifting gears big time today. We're gonna we're gonna move ahead and talk about some different kinds of functions. We've talked about lines a lot and things like lines. Now we're gonna talk about curves. Instead of things being straight, they're gonna be curvy. So a quadratic function has the form. Go ahead. Is Lily gonna be working with graphs? Oh yeah. 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 Lots of graphs all here. Yep. Big part of algebra. Okay, so uh, a quadratic function is one that can always be written in this form. This is what we're going to call general form or standard form. Notice this is a little different than what we're used to. Instead of just have, this looks pretty familiar, doesn't it? If I cover up that first term, what does that look like? The letters are a little different than we're used to, but. Yeah, looks like slope intercept. It's just a line. Now, we would have called it back when we were talking about lines. Instead of a B, we would have made that an M, and we would have made that C into a B, MX plus B. But that's all right. It doesn't matter. Whatever we let the letters be, they mean the same thing. The coefficient of X would have been the slope, and that would have been the Y-intercept. But when we add this extra term, it changes things dramatically. Now the, the, the graph is no longer straight. It's curved. It always has this kind of a look to it, parabola. Okay. So a parabola is, people say it's U-shaped. I mean, it's sort of U-shaped. Uh, it's a very important shape, though. In, in math and science, this is, this is something that we get a lot of use out of, typical use. I'll be using this weekend as I'm watching some football games is satellite dish, right? Yeah. Satellite dish is parabolic. Now, why is your satellite dish parabolic? It's parabolic because parabolas have some really interesting properties, very important properties. Now, think what your satellite dish does when you're tuned into a game. Where, where is it pointed, first of all? It's in the sky. But where in the sky? This is kind of an interesting concept here, interesting topic. Point south, doesn't it? They always point south, either due south or almost due south. They're always pointing south. Now, if you were to watch a... a football game in Australia, though, where would it point? North it point north. Yeah. Okay, how come? Anybody know why that is? Because they're below the equator. <laughs> Magnets and stuff. Uh, well, okay, indirectly, yeah, but now what are you pointing at? when you're pointing your satellite dish up in the sky. Okay, you're pointing it at satellite. Okay, now I want you to think, you've probably never thought about this very much though. Just, what's the, what's the seem like maybe there's a problem with there? What do satellites tend to do? They tend to move, right? They orbit the Earth, right? So why is it that your satellite dish doesn't have to have a tracking device on it that tracks satellite stuff? Because why? No, no. Have you any ideas? How come? Because it's pointed. Uh, you, I, if, has anybody ever had any experience with like trying to align a satellite dish? No. Or have you accidentally bumped one? Or, I mean, oh my God, it is hard to do to get those things so that they're you get a good signal. I mean, they have to be really precisely aligned. Now, if that satellite was was traveling around the Earth, uh, that shouldn't work, right? It shouldn't work because it should drift out of the path of where that thing's focused. So I move it to Earth. Ah, there you go. There's there's the key. It's called a geosynchronous satellite. Geo means Earth. Synchronous means locked together. And so the reason we point them south, and this is this isn't really related to what we're talking about today, but it's interesting, and it sort of indirectly relates, uh, is this. If this is the Earth. And there's the North Pole, let's say. We're looking down from the North Pole. Okay, the Earth is spinning on its axis, right? And so it's spinning around like this. Okay, satellites are going to orbit around the Earth, but if they orbit over the equator and they orbit at just the right altitude, it takes satellites. So here's our satellite up here traveling along in its orbit. If it's traveling at just the right altitude, it takes it exactly 24 hours to make one revolution around the Earth. Okay? If it's too close to the Earth, objects that are very close to the Earth, I think like right over the surface, I think it'd take about 40 minutes for it to go around the Earth. 
And if it's really, really far away, like if we went out here millions of miles, and let's say that all the other planets were taken away and it was just the Earth, well, then it might take that satellite years to go around the Earth. But if you get just the closer it gets, the, 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 the shorter the period of its orbit, the shorter time it takes to go around the planet. So if we get just the right altitude, it's exactly 24 hours. That's important because then the Earth is turning at the same rate that the satellite is rotating, and so the satellite will always appear over the same position on the Earth. Now, that can only work on the equator, though, can it? Right? Because if it wasn't lined up on the equator, for example, if this is, if this is the Earth, and let's say this is the North Pole and that's the South Pole, so here's the equator, if the satellite were going in an orbit, let's say, like this, that's not going to work. Because then it's going to drift north and south a little bit, isn't it? Right? See what I'm saying? It's got to be lined up directly over the equator so that satellite can always hover over the same point on the ground. And that's why your the dishes always point south, because they're pointing at those geosynchronous satellites. Uh, is, questions on that? Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So that, I mean, not that that's directly related, but how does that relate to parabolas? Well, here. If, if you're... If you're focusing that satellite dish at these geosynchronous satellites that are, God, I, don't know, I can't remember exactly how high they would be, but I'm going to say they're probably up there, oh, 50,000 miles ish, something like that. So they're really far above the Earth. So the, the direct line of sight to those things is going to be long ways, and many tens of thousands of miles. So that signal, by the time that signal gets to us, the, 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 the rays, the signals that are coming in the really just electromagnetic waves, just like light, but you can't see it, that's, that's, uh, that's coming towards our dish and is being intercepted by our dish, it's coming from so far away that those rays are coming in essentially parallel. They're coming in just as if they've come from infinitely far away. They're so far away that you can't really see them diverging anymore because, you know, you see, you see my point? They're coming in. It's, it's like, I didn't say that very clearly. Let me think of another example of that. If you, if you get, if, if a sphere expands, like let's say we start with something that's just a normal spherical balloon. When it's relatively small, you can see that curvature really easily, right? But if I make it really big, like the size of the Earth, and you're right next to it, it's going to look just like a flat surface. You're not going to see that curvature anymore, right? Just like you can't see the curvature of the Earth if you're sitting in a boat on the ocean, right? Because it's such a big curve. That, uh, you know, that it looks basically flat. So those rays that are coming in from that satellite, which is much farther away than the radius of the Earth, it's a lot bigger sphere than the Earth, they're coming in flat. So the rays are all coming in parallel. Now, the, the reason that's important is because parabolas have this interesting property that rays that come in, we, in, in, in physics we'd say rays that come in from infinity, meaning just really far away. So they're coming in parallel. They all get bounced around in there, but they all get reflected through a common point called the focal point. They take different paths. Like this guy right here might come down here and bounce around a little bit, but eventually they're all going to go through that point. Right? No matter where they hit the dish, they always get focused through that point. What do you suppose, when you think about these satellite dishes, they always look like kind of like a big platter, but then there's that little thingamajig sticking up in the middle. Why do, you, why do you think? Why do you think that's to use technical term? Why do you think that's there? A little thingamajig in the middle of the satellite. For all our that's focuses. that's there. Yeah, that's the antenna. The dish itself, all it's there to do is reflect. But that's the only part that actually really does anything. It actually receives the signals. But all the signals get reflected through that one point, and so they get amplified a whole bunch. And that's why the dish works so well. Uh, if you needed to communicate with something much farther away than those satellites, you have to use a bigger dish, probably. Um, but that's how it works. That may not seem, I mean, if you think about those satellite dishes, they're only yay big, right? I mean, it doesn't, I mean, could that be enough power to, you know, could you focus a signal that's strong enough to get a good link with a satellite? It almost doesn't seem like you could. But really, there's, if you think about this, I mean, I imagine probably everybody at some point in their lives, you've had a magnifying glass and you burn a piece of grass or something in sunlight, right? I still do it. Still do it? Okay. Now, that's just a tiny piece of glass that big, right? And it's focusing it down to a, to a bright enough point that it actually can start a fire. So the same kind of concept is going on here. You're taking a weak signal and you're magnifying it 
make a much stronger signal. There was a story recently I heard, but this is kind of weird. Uh, this, I can't remember what city this was in. Let me see if I can find the video. There, they, these architects built this, I think it was in Europe, built this really fancy, architecturally amazing building that where the sides, it was all enclosed in glass, and like most skyscrapers are. But instead of the sides being straight, they were sort of cylindrically indented. And it looked really cool, but have you heard about this? But, but the problem with this was when the sun would pass by this thing, when it got to just the right angle, the sun's rays would hit this, this side of this building and get focused down, and it ended up like melting some cars. That's how, that's how strong the, the reflected rays were from this building. I mean, it was that, and it wasn't like it was a really super fine focus, but it was enough that over a long period of time, it literally started these cars on fire. So they had to change the building. Uh, so that, that's what a parabola does. Now it works both ways too. If you were to look at the, like if you wanted to, to transmit a signal back up to the satellite, which you actually do when you change, you know, I mean, you can, you can communicate with the satellite. Uh, all you have to do is reverse this process. So instead of the incoming rays being reflected from that little thingamajig in the middle, all it has to do is shoot out the signals pointing down, and they'll all get reflected out parallel, and so they won't diverge. They won't. They won't. Uh, the, the beam won't weaken and get wider. It'll just stay, stay real collimated, stay a real tight, nice beam. And it goes right back up to the satellite. You can send a pretty weak signal that will travel all the way up there and communicate with it that way. So important shape for many reasons. That's just one of them. That's just the one that came to mind. But we got to learn about these things. All right, so parabolas. Okay, first of all, the anatomy of a parabola. We, we say that the, the, the tip of the parabola we call the vertex, right? That's sort of like the point of the parabola. Just like we had a vertex for the V-shaped absolute value functions, same idea here. Notice that it has symmetry. Symmetry is a big deal in math. We always want to try to exploit symmetry when we can because it makes the math much easier. So in this case, if I draw a vertical line right through the vertex, wouldn't you agree that, let's say I printed this on paper, if I folded the paper along that line, wouldn't the two halves of the parabola fold onto each other perfectly? Right? So it has line symmetry or reflective symmetry. Okay, that's important. Uh, this is, you know, this is typically what they look like. Only thing I want you to notice here, maybe, is that the blue parabola, y equals x squared, opens up. The red parabola, when we put a negative sign in front, it opens down. That's, if you think about it, that shouldn't be too surprising. We talked about that earlier when we talked about reflections. If you multiply a function by negative 1, remember what that did. It just reflected over the x-axis, right? So that's all we've really done here with the red one. Okay, so let me skip through this. Okay, so we want to look at the different ways that we can write quadratic functions. There's three ways, and I, I'm sure you're thinking, why three? Why do we need three? Uh, well, you don't necessarily need three, but it's useful to have three. In different circumstances or for different situations, each of these three could be important. This is the basic one. This is what we call standard form or general form. Uh, y equals ax squared plus bx plus c. Okay, now what do we know about this? Well, we know that its shape is U-shaped if, if it's a quadratic function. We already got that part. If the quadratic coefficient, so the coefficient of x squared, the a, if a is positive, it opens up. If a is negative, it opens down. More specifically, and we don't need to get too specific right now, but if we wanted to, more specifically, if a is a big number, if the absolute value is a big number, like 10 or 20 or something like that, or 4, it's bigger than 1, it's going to take that basic U shape and it's going to stretch it upwards and make it tall and skinny. If the absolute value of A is less than 1, so if it's, for example, a fraction like 1 half or 1 third or negative 1 third, then it's going to take that U shape and push it down and make it shorter and wider. Okay? That, not that that's that big a deal. I mean, it's, that's enough just to know that A tells you if it opens up or down most of the time. Okay, this is important, though. If we want to ever sketch the graph of a parabola, 
The way we always want to do this, or typically want to do this, is we want to start with the vertex and then sketch a parabola from there. We've got to find the vertex, though. Well, if you're given some quadratic function in general form like this, remember, A, B, and C are going to be numbers, right? And so this is the little expression that tells us what the x-coordinate of the vertex is. It's always equal to whatever you get when you uh, evaluate negative B over 2A. Okay? Once I know that, the x-coordinate, I could always find the y-coordinate by just plugging that x value in and seeing what we get. So let's, let's look at an example of that. It's easier to see in an example. So there is a quadratic function, standard form or general form, whatever you want to call it. Everybody agrees A is 2, B is negative 8, and C is 6? Mm -hmm. Okay. So then where is the x-coordinate of the vertex going to be? How would I find it? Do you remember that little expression? Negative b over 2a, there you go. So if we plug that in, those values, into negative b over 2a, what do we get? Well, b we said was negative 8. Uh, a was 2, so negative, negative 8 is what? Positive 8 over 4 is 2, right? So the x-coordinate of the vertex is 2. How much we know? What about the y-coordinate? Well, all I have to do is take that 2 and just feed it back into the original function substitute that for x, and I can solve for y, right? So what do we get? 2 squared is 4 times 2 is 8, minus 8 times 2, so minus 16 would be negative 8, plus 6 would be negative 2. All right, so we get the coordinates of the vertex are at 2, negative 2, so we can, we can start there. Does this one open up or down? Up. Up. How come? A is positive. A lot of times, that's all we need is where is the vertex and does it open up? Usually, or you know, half the time at least, that's all we need. If we want to get a little bit more specific and get a little better sketch of our, get away, yes, sir. Uh, if, if we want to get a little better sketch of our parabola, we might want to guide the sketch with a couple extra points. So here's how we could do that. We could make a little t-table and we could choose a couple values. So there's our axis of symmetry. Now, what values would we pick? If that's our function, we know there's our vertex. We're just going to make a t-table like we always have in the past. right? And we want to get pick a value of x and find a value of y. Now, there's a lot of them I could pick. If the vertex is at positive 2, I could pick a value like x equals 1 or x equals 0 or negative 1. Or I could pick one like x equals 3 or x equals 4 or x equals 5. And if I plug those in, it's going to tell me the y values, and I can plot those points. Do I, let me ask you this, a couple questions here. Do I want to pick a value that's really far away to the right or to the left from the vertex? Probably not. How come? You're right. So it's easy. Yeah, think what parabolas look like. Parabolas sort of accelerate. The further you go away from them, the steeper they get, right? And so if I go out here any distance at all, if I go out here like four or five away from the vertex, the y value that I generate might be way up there, way off the ground. So I want to generally pick x values that are close to home so I don't get really super big y values. Okay? So then my choices are probably limited to like 0 or 1 or 3 or 4. Now, which of those sound easier to plug in? Yeah, 0 and 1 sound easier, don't they? We want to pick small numbers to plug in. So why not pick something like, for example, 0 is a good choice. 0 is the easiest one of all to ever plug in. In this case, it's a good choice. It's close to 2. So if I plug 0 into that function up there, what am I going to get? 2 times 0, that goes away. Minus 8 times 0, that goes away. So 6, yeah. I just get the point 0, 6, right? So that gives me a point. Now, we want to use symmetry to avoid doing work if we can. So we went over 0 and up 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. How could I get another freebie point there when I don't have to do anything? If I think about symmetry. Yeah, just reflect it over. Good. If I, instead of going 2 to the right, what if I just went 2 to the left over there and created a mirror image point? Okay. That's really uh, all I need to do. Okay. If I've got these points, I know that this is basically a U-shape, and from here you're just sketching it. If I want to do a graph, I'm using a calculator anyway. So for a sketch, 
I would just create kind of a tall U shape like that, and that's my parabola. Okay, make sense? Yeah. The book says, and the PowerPoint say, make two points on each side. I think one is plenty. Okay, so there's one point we could have picked. There's the other point we did pick. Just reflect those over, connect the dots with the U, and there's your sketch of a parabola. Okay, so that's how we how we graph or, or sketch a parabola when it when the quadratic function is written in general form. Okay, there's two other forms. You got to be familiar with all these. They're all we're going to use all these a lot. Okay, one of these is called vertex form. The reason it's called vertex form is because it uses the x and y coordinates of the vertex right in the the function. Okay, this ought to look pretty familiar. Do you remember when we, earlier in the year, were talking about absolute value functions? Absolute value functions, we said, look like this. Y equals A times, instead of the quantity squared, it was just the absolute value of X minus H plus K. Remember that? Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay, that looks pretty familiar, doesn't it? Now, the absolute value functions were V-shaped instead of U-shaped, but they basically are sort of the same kinds of things, right? What did we say about this? What did A tell us about the absolute value function, about the V? Up or down. And it actually even told us more specifically, didn't it, what the slope of the right side was. But for now, up or down is fine. That's fine. What did H and K tell us? Yeah, the coordinates of the vertex, the point of the V, right? It works the same way for parabolas, exact same way. So the fact that we've already done that makes this a lot easier. Okay, so there's vertex form. The axis of symmetry, the vertex is at HK. The axis of symmetry is just X equals whatever the X coordinate of the vertex is always. And to graph these things, well, I guess we'll do an example here. So I tell you what, let's... Let's skip ahead and do an example, and then we'll come back. So what if we wanted to graph this thing, this parabola? This time, we're not given the function in standard form. We're given the function in vertex form, right? So there's the form. We have to pick the values now of A and H and K. But knowing those makes this really simple. If we know those, this is an easy thing to do. OK, so what are they? What's A? Get negative 1 half. So the parabola opens up or down? Yeah. Down, OK? Now here's where we got to be a little bit careful. And the same trick that applied with the absolute value functions applies here. What's the value of h? Ah, OK, negative 3, not positive 3, right? Notice that, that in the vertex form, h is the number being subtracted from x, right? And, and so it's we know that. The sign of h is always going to be opposite of whatever that operation is, because it's being subtracted. So h is negative 3. What's k? 4. OK, so the vertex then is going to be located at negative 3, positive 4. Right? And once we find that, that's the hardest part. That's not very hard with this form. Can you just ignore the squared? Yes. Yeah, you just ignore the squared, because I mean, we're not actually, we're going to end up taking that into account. But at this point, all we want to do is find what is that number inside the parentheses that's attached to the x. OK, and just by, it's easier than the last example we did, because we don't have to calculate anything. Remember, last time we had to actually use that little formula to calculate the x-coordinate. This time, it's just right there. We can just say, aha, h is negative 3. So there's the x-coordinate. k is 4. Done. OK? So there's the vertex. We know it opens down. Maybe that's enough. If we want to get more specific, we'll just use the same trick we used before. We'll just make a t-table and, and pick some, some values. So real quick, what might be a good, va uh, a good another x value to pick? Let me go maybe one step further, put, put in the axis of symmetry. <coughs> So there's the axis of symmetry. I'll make my table down here. Oops. Oh, can't do that. I'm giving away all my secrets. OK, so if we make a t-table, you tell me what might be a good choice for an x value here. If, if the vertex is lined up at x equals negative 3, do I probably want to go to the left or the right here? Right. To the right. Yeah, I want to get smaller numbers that are 
have smaller absolute values. So negative one or negative two would be better than four, negative four or negative five, right? Doesn't really matter. How about if we take negative two? Negative two is gonna combine with that three pretty easily, right? So if I plug in x equals negative two, what do I get? What's negative two plus three? One squared? What's one squared? One. So that whole thing right there just becomes a one times negative one half. Negative one half, right? Plus four would be uh, what? Three and a half? Does that make sense? So we go back two and up three and a half. So right there. So you can already see this can be a little bit wider parabola than normal. Okay. I could reflect that point over there and just get something like that, right? There's my parabola. Okay. Make sense? It's easy. It's not a big deal, is it? It's not a big deal. Okay, so pick whatever points you want. They picked, you know, picked different points than we did, but it doesn't matter. So if we pick that one and reflected it over, same thing. There's the other point. Just connect in a U shape and we got it. All right. So the other form that I skipped through, I got to go back a little bit. And then this is really it. This is end of the new stuff. Okay, the other form is called intercept form, or even a better way of saying this is it's factored form. So we'll probably end up calling this factored form, but either way is fine. Intercept form or factored. Okay, look, look how this is written. This time, the, the three parameters are A, P, and Q instead of A, H, and K, or A, B, and C. Now, I, you know, I might even say something about that real quick. If, if you, this is kind of interesting, too. If you think about, if I wanted to specify a line, wouldn't you agree lines are simpler than parabolas? Okay, if I, if I took a line, and I wanted to make two tweaks. That's all I'm going to say is I wanted to make two tweaks to this purple line. And I wanted to overlap it on top of this orange line. I'm going to superimpose the two. What's the minimum number of adjustments I would have to make to that purple line to get it to match up on the, on the orange line? What do you think? Yeah, I heard two. And that's a good answer. That's correct. You can't do it in fewer than two moves. Because if I just take this whole thing and just slide it as it is, it's never going to match up on that orange one, is it? So at the very least, I would have to rotate it and then slide it. Or I could even do something like this. No matter how, no matter what strategy you come up with, you're always going to have to tweak two things. What if I, what if I took two points on this thing and I drag this point over to there, then I still have to drag that point over to there. I got to do two things no matter what. Does that sort of make sense what I'm getting at there? Okay. It's not an accident that lines require two parameters. You got to dial in two numbers to specify a line, a slope and a y-intercept. Parabolas are a little bit more complicated. Parabolas require three. I have to dial in an A and an H and a K, or I dial in an A and a P and a Q, or I could dial in an A and a B and a C, right? But I got to adjust three things to get a parabola exactly where I want it. Okay, so when we write it in this form, Y equals A times the quantity X minus P times the quantity X minus Q, P and Q are the X-intercepts. So that's where it's crossing the X-axis. So this one would only be applicable if the parabola actually does intersect the x-axis, and it doesn't have to. But if it does, this works. Okay, so then we know that the axis of symmetry has to be halfway in between, doesn't it? Because it's got that folding symmetry. So if the x-intercepts are at P and Q, halfway in the middle is where we're going to get that axis of symmetry, right? And if we want to find the x-coordinate, then all we have to do is just average those two x-values. So let's look at an example. So what about this one? Okay, so this is in intercept form, right? A times x minus p times x minus q. So would you agree that a out in front there is negative one? Yep. Right? 
P is the number that's being subtracted from X, and so it's opposite of that operation. So P is negative 2, Q is positive 4. Agree? Let me see that. That's a little tricky. Once I know what those numbers are, <clears throat> it's pretty easy to graph this thing. In fact, this might even be the easiest one. I know that the x-intercepts are going to be at the values of p and q. So one of them is over here at x equals negative 2. One of them is up here at positive 4. Does this one open up or down? How come? A is negative, so it opens down. Exactly. So we know the parabola is going to do this kind of a thing, right? We just need to know where the vertex is. Well, how can I find the vertex if I know that the x-intercepts are at negative 2 and positive 4? It's got to be symmetrical, doesn't it? So it's got to be in the middle. Well, what's our mathematical way of finding a middle value? Yeah, what's the middle value of 3 and 11? How do you find it? Real quick. What do you think? Add the two values and divide by Yeah, you average. Add them and divide by 2, right? We can do the same thing here. OK. Oh, I think. Did I skip through that? Maybe I did. I can write it down. If it... Oh, it didn't. Well, OK, it didn't show us that. But that is the way to do it. That is the way to do it. We'll just average the two. So we would just take negative 2 plus 4 divided by 2. Just gives us 2 over 2, which is 1. So x equals 1 is the middle value. That's the x coordinate of the vertex. How do I find the y value if I know an x value? Always? Plug it in. Plug it into the function. See what we get. So if I plug in x equals 1, I get what? Negative 1 times 3 times negative 3. So negative 3 times negative 3 is positive 9, right? So there's our vertex. Positive 1, positive 9. Connect those three dots and you're done. That's it. No big deal, right? OK, so this is really a, a minor stuff. I'll just, really quickly, I'll just show you this, but it's not a big deal at all. Okay, How do you change quadratic functions from intercept form or vertex form to standard form? All you do is just multiply them out, just simplify. You just multiply them out and collect like terms, and they're automatically, they always end up in general form. So you know that is foiling. Okay? So for example, and you, everyone's seen this, I'm sure. If I want to multiply the binomial x plus 3 times x plus 5, then I just first times first gives me x squared. There's the f, right? Product of the outside terms, the x and the 5 gives us a 5x. So there's the o for outside. Yeah, 3 and x is the inner product. And then 3 times 5 is the last product. And you just add up like terms, right? The 3x and the 5x go together to make an 8x. We got it. All right. So, how much time we got? Not enough. Not enough.